Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Database Systems, uh, week number two, and this is the lecture video. Um, <clears throat> there are three things that I want to talk to you about this week. Uh, and this week's uh, lecture video uh, somewhat overlaps the uh, weekly overview. Uh, but I do want to go into a little bit more in depth uh, about each one of those, uh, namely installation of the SQL Server, uh, SQL Server terms, and authentication. So in terms of SQL Server uh, installation, uh, I did mention to you uh, what you need a, a, a Windows OS operating system. For Mac users, uh, you know, you, you need a Windows operating system. You can get uh, Parallax or maybe use a virtual machine of some sort uh, to use. Uh, Parallax comes with uh, uh, Windows uh, operating system already, so there's nothing more you have to do. But if you're using a virtual box or a virtual machine, uh, you do need to uh, uh, obtain a uh, Windows operating system um, there may be some out there, uh, but think maybe a uh, an issue that, that you may run into. Um, but anyway, uh, you need a uh, Windows Act, uh, OS to get started. But in terms of the actual download and installation of the uh, Microsoft SQL Server uh, 2019, uh, there is a detailed instruction uh, posted on Blackboard. Uh, so uh, let me show that to you real quick. So here is the um, a assignment and here's an instruction and so on and so forth. Uh, this one is the uh, Management Studio 18, but uh, maybe a newer, uh, maybe out there, but they're pretty much the same. Um, before uh, downloading and installing your SQL Server, as a good uh, Kamsai student, uh, you want to look at the uh, requirements for both hardware and software. So I put a link here for you to take a look. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So when you click on the link, I should take you to a SQL Server 2019 hardware and software requirements. And as you uh, browse through it, you know, take a look at them and see what, um, uh, what it says. Uh, and like here's you know hard disk drive monitor and particularly memory and processor speed and the types and stuff like that. Uh, there's some software uh, that it is expecting you to have and and so on and so forth. Uh, so on the one hand you want to take a look at them. On the other hand, the best practice is not to barely meet those requirements. Uh, those requirements are established you know, assuming that that is the only thing you're going to be doing on the computer. So. Uh, let me point out to you the memory, the minimum here is like 1 gig or 512. If you actually have only that, I guarantee you that you're not going to be able to make your uh, SQL Server run properly. So you usually want to double up uh, those uh, minimum requirements. Uh, preferably, you know, nowadays most uh, uh, laptops and computers come with at least 8 gigabytes. So I would expect you to assign uh, four gig uh, gigabytes for that uh, SQL Server running, all right. And uh, you know, uh, if you have a 16 gigabyte RAM or 32, that's even better. Uh, but I would give half of what your you know main system has uh, for your SQL Server operation. But preferably, whatever it is, uh, use about uh, a four uh, gig rather than just one. Otherwise, it's you know sometimes it just fails because it takes too long. Uh, and the memory is definitely uh, the, the main culprit. Um, you know, the hard disk, if you got six gig left, uh, the, oh, again, that's going to fail. I would assume that you would need about 100 gig uh, a free space. And the proce uh, processor speed and the number of uh, uh, the chips, I would say, you know, this is barely at the minimum, and you probably need about uh, two uh a processors all right for that so give give some of that uh, some thoughts and uh, uh you know make sure that you have those uh best practice requirements not just a bare minimum requirements then go down there uh and actually install so if you go down there to 
look at the installation, you know, you have uh, a two main options. You can, you know, uh, there are some variations of these as you start to download and install and, and so on and so forth, but these are the two. Uh, again, expresses the minimum requirement, but I uh, prefer you to do the developer edition and uh, I'll be able to look at all the stuff that is out there because, you know, you're not just trying to get by. Uh, people will be looking uh, towards you uh, for your expertise, and uh, I'd like you to go through the full-fledged uh, developer edition. All right. So uh, that's what it is. I, you know, did may have mentioned to you that you can install 2019 um, on those operating systems, but they're really uh, tricky and pain in the butt. There are other editions. Let me see if I can get. Um, anyway, so. Um, that, that's what I expect you to do. If for some reason, for your technical uh, limitations or what, what have you, uh, if you opt out for anything other than uh, the develop full developer edition, uh, then just be mindful that you may be short on some things. All right. So uh, download it and uh, do take some time to uh, do it right and uh, refer to the. Uh, documentation posted on the, uh, the website or Blackboard. Um, after downloading successfully on your, your uh, SQL Server on your uh, computer, now you need to install the uh, Management Studio. Management Studio uh, is typically the way that people use, uh, so you need to go down there and uh, actually download this here. Uh, if you, you know, this is the uh, 29, let's see what it is here. Uh, SQL Server Management Suite 19, and so just click on this one. This one should be pretty straightforward, pretty quick, uh, shouldn't take you too long. And uh, after that, uh, you will be able to use a SQL Server using the, um, uh, the Management Studio. So the way you, you um, well, let me show you how mine looks like. So give me one second. So this, so this is how it starts. I uh, start this not the SQL Server, but I start with the SQL Server Management Studio. And when it actually opens up, uh, you, you will see um, that uh, this little icon or the interface will pop up. And uh, this is the Management Studio allowing you to connect to whatever you have installed. And here is, you know, I installed a database engine analysis and all those uh, other things. But the main one that we're going to be using is the database engine so I select that the server name uh, you know if you if this is the only installation you've done then you should have only one of them out there but for me I installed a whole bunch of them out there so uh, you know you need to pick whatever you want to use you know I also have here's a SQL Express uh, SQL Server 2019 uh, you know if you want to use the uh, developer one maybe I'll do that uh, do that one and I'm using the Windows authentication uh, is by default that was part of your installation uh, steps that you chose. Uh, certainly you can use other authentications in which case you will need to set up your credentials accordingly. Uh, but I am uh, I'm, Windows authentication simply means that if you already are logged into the Windows environment, which I am, uh, then you don't need to provide anything else. Just a word of caution, if you're using someone else's or your work or whatever, then you do need to log in as the administrator uh, when you start the SQL Server uh, Management Studio. Otherwise, it may fail and give you some uh, uh, error messages. But anyway, uh, I click on the connect, then it takes a minute. It actually comes up here. Let me see if I can give you the full uh, outlook here. So here is the uh, instance of the SQL Server that I've installed. It is in my domain here, it is a name that I gave, and then here is the uh, detail name with the credential that I have, or at least the user ID. And then here are the stuff that comes with, uh, come, uh, uh, that are under this particular instance. You can have more than one instances if you have, so if you just do the connect and I want to do another database, let's say I have an express edition here somewhere, then I want to connect to that for testing purposes or whatever, if you connect notice that I have two instances. So you can have multiple instances, instances I should say, and you can play different uh, testing scenarios and, and whatever. So 
anyway um, you can go in there uh, you can open up the databases uh, I installed the adventure works which we will do that next week um, or next time this is a data warehousing and so on and so forth so you can uh, open up uh, adventure works here and you have the some tables here uh, and you can open up uh, uh, double click on whatever or right click on as you say and you can select uh, top 1000 rows and you can see uh, in a minute that it'll pull up all you know it's nice kind of gives you uh, uh, the SQL script and then all the data here all right so we'll be doing that but I just want to give you a quick demo how that uh, looks like all right so that's what that's all about anyway so that's all that and let's talk a little bit about the SQL terms uh, this is one of the assignments so I won't talk everything and give you all the answers but I want to give you some overview so you know there's ANSI, ANSI is a standard uh, a form uh, and the basic SQL would be the uh, ANSI SQL but every vendor will have its own particular variation that is added on top of the ANSI SQL um, let me get you so I just pulled up the uh, ANSI, which is the American National Standard Institute. Uh, among other uh, things that they do is standardize. So in terms of the database management system, uh, it gave, you know it provides a, a you know a basics a structure for what uh, SQL needs to be. And so if you look at some some of these things, I think I may have given it to you. Hold on. So here is the you know basic some differences between regular uh, NC SQL and uh, T SQL. T SQL stands for transactional SQL, uh, which Microsoft is using. And uh, in addition to the basic SQL uh, syntax and commands, Microsoft uh, transactional SQL is uh, added on top of that, um, and it is its main uh, purpose is to uh, tailor and customize some of the syntaxes. Uh, that are used for uh, making transactions like when you are making a transaction on your uh, bank or purchasing an airline ticket and, and things like that there are some special uh, syntax and, and uh, commands that uh, that are useful for that sort of, uh, of functionalities there are other kinds of SQL out there uh, you know they're uh, but they're similar they're not exactly the same they're uh, vendor dependent but for the Microsoft, it will be talk, uh, using uh, both the basic uh, but predominantly uh, uh, transactional SQL. Um, in terms of the data model, uh, it, you know, data should have some structure uh, for it to store and manage and control user access and, and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, we did look at some of the data models uh, last week, uh, but, you know, there are different data models uh, that are out there uh, but it is a structure that you are uh, bargaining in when you uh, are designing or implementing a database uh, system uh, you can't have you know uh, multiple different data models for a one particular system uh, because it just doesn't make any sense all the data in one particular database uh, should have the same uh, modelings out there so take a look at them you know the, uh, there are conceptual, logic, physical, and, and so on and so forth in, in terms of techniques. Uh, there are hierarchical network relational uh, data uh, modeling, which we'll be using for this class, and then we'll be using the entity relationship data modeling to design as well. Procedural and non-procedural. Uh, well, maybe before that, um, so the DDL and D DML, you know, just a fancy name for uh, dividing uh, the SQL um, into different uh, categories. So uh, DDL stands for data definition language, whereas the DML stands for data manipulation languages. So the SQL's commands that are uh, geared toward defining uh, the table structures rather than uh, SQL uh, commands that are used for uh, manipulating, such as, you know, um, uh, looking up, changing and editing, uh, uh, and stuff like that uh, so there are different ones out there and you can take a look at them uh, so like search and you know that would be uh, we'll, we'll look at a little bit more at the, in terms of the examples later on procedural and non-procedural uh, data uh, manipulation languages 
so there is an article that I uh, put on here for you. Uh, but basically, um, uh, so the DMR have two uh, types, uh, non-procedural. Uh, the non-procedural uh, just specify what data is required. Um, and, you know, most of the SQL is like that. Uh, but the uh, DML can also be a non-procedural language where um, it specifies not only what data is required, but how to access. In other words, uh, and, and one example here uh, is the relational algebra. But anyway, so like when you want to go, um, <clears throat> so there's a basic, uh, some of the SQL statements here, like when you want to uh, select uh, and stuff like that, you know, that's all. Uh, database uh, management uh, or manipulation languages. Um, so uh, we'll talk more about those guys. Data integrity is also important for our uh, cl class when we deal with database management systems because uh, we take it for granted that the data is both accurate, well not both, uh, they're accurate uh, for what it represents and it is complete and it's not like partial uh, and it is consistent, uh, you know, whenever you look at it, you know, it should give you the same uh, results uh, and not, you know, so-and-so look, looks it up, it looks different or whatever, although there are different, you know, scopes and whatnot. And it is valid, right? So, and there are a few other items that we could talk about, but, you know, we'll be talking more about the data integrity, how to, uh, you know, enforce that, uh, what happens uh, what what we can do to prevent it from going out of whack, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, that's what we want to be aware of. And then, uh, lastly, the uh, database authentication or authorization. Uh, let me put that on there. So, authorization and uh, authentication and authorization. Auth authentication is to authenticate, you know, somebody who claims to be who that person is. You know, how do we actually, you know, make uh, make sure that is the the case. And there are strong, uh, you know, uh, uh, authentications out there, you know, including the uh, two-factor and, you know, uh, question and answers and stuff like that, uh, maybe using some fobs or any other devices. Uh, but, you know, we continue to find that companies, uh, especially small organizations, continue to use a weak authentication or no authentication at all, right? And that's just, that's just asking for trouble. So. Uh, the main reason that I see is because of its cost and, uh, you know, time and money to set that up and to enforce it. Um, and, you know, uh, so uh, that being the major corporate, I think that even some of the medium-sized organizations fall into that. And so I'd like you to kind of look into that as to why uh, some of the reasons that they're doing. Authorization. Uh, uh, authorization is more to do with uh, is this user authorized to access or update or what have you uh, for a certain types uh, or group of data, right? So a student worker may be approved to certain uh, ty uh, you know, types of information, whereas the, the faculty may have something different and the administrators may have something different. Uh, accounts payable may have something, you know, their own kind of like that. So. You know, that's more of the authorizing what uh, and how much, right? And uh, uh, it is typically role-based uh, rather than person-based. So we don't give, uh, that's the best practice, we don't give a authorization to John Doe, but rather we give a uh, certain authorization uh, to access certain uh, kinds of uh, data based on that person's role as a student worker, faculty, uh, staff and, and what have you, right? So temporary or contractor. So uh, when that person leaves, we don't have to recreate the whole thing. We can just put a person into that role and if there may be more than one person in a role uh, group, right? So that's the, uh, the best practice. Anyway, that's a brief overview of what I wanted to share with you for this week. I hope that uh, makes some sense. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to answer. Take care. Bye for now.